Hello, and welcome to A Guide for Healthcare Leaders, Dave Lawrence and Mary Pittman in Conversation. My name is Star Tiffany, and I will be running today's web forum with my colleague, Tanya Hammond. If you experience technical difficulties during this WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229-3239 for assistance. You may want to write that number down for future reference. The audio portion of the web form can be heard through your computer speakers or a headset plugged into your computer. If at any time you are having technical difficulties regarding audio, please send a question in the Q&A panel, panel, and Tanya or I will provide the teleconference information to you. Once the web form ends today, a survey evaluation will open in a new window. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation as we need your feedback to improve our web form. And I just wanted to remind everyone that the recording and presentation slides will be available at Dialogue for Health. That's www.dialogue, the number four, h-e-a-l-t-h dot o-r-g. And then if you'd like to also connect with us on Twitter or Facebook, we also have those URLs up on the screen for you right now. Um, so... I just want to make sure that um, I show you exactly how you can send a question in through the Q&A feature. So there's a screen shot on the screen right now. And um, we would greatly appreciate your questions and any comments you may have about today's presentation. And to do so, you'll just want to click the question mark icon, type your question in, and hit send. And please be sure to send all your questions to all panelists. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Pittman. Dr. Pittman is the president and CEO of the Public Health Institute, only the second person to hold the job since PHI's founding in 1964. She is nationally recognized leader in improving community health and addressing health inequities, previously working for the Health Research and Education Trust and the California Association of Public Hospitals. We welcome her to our web forum today. Dr. Pittman, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Star, and I want to welcome our audience to our dialogue today with Dr. David Lawrence. Um, I do appreciate Dialogue for Health for sponsoring this event. Dialogue for Health is a project of the Public Health Institute and creates these online workshops, web forums, and opportunities to help bring different perspectives and organizations together to have conversations about public health and pressing health and healthcare issues of our time. Take a look at the website, as Star mentioned before, and you can see uh, upcoming forums, and you can also access forums that have been archived. I also want to thank the California Endowment, which is a sponsor of our event today, for their uh, longstanding support of this kind of educational forum. Today's forum will have a little different format than our usual panel event. And it's going to be conducted more in a conversational style instead of a presentation. The auto, audio recording will be available on the website soon. And you will be able to also access slides. And I want to take a moment just to explain that the, the slides that will be appearing on the screen during our conversation will be more background slides. We won't be speaking directly from those slides, and many of them are focused on data related to health and health care costs and the um, health reform. And while we won't go through them in detail, they may be useful for you in other settings and, and for other information. Um, at the end, we will be focusing on a couple of slides related specifically to the book that Dr. Lawrence will be speaking about today. So right now, I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. David Lawrence. He's the former CEO of Kaiser Permanente, a position he held from 1991 through 2002. Since that time, he's been active in consulting, writing, and advising private equity and venture capital firms. His first book, From Chaos to Care, The Promise of Team-Based Medicine, was published in 2002 and served as a guide for many in healthcare who were trying to transform their organization at that time. His current book, Best Care, Best Future, A Guide for Healthcare Leaders, 
was just released by Second River Healthcare Publishing Company. And you can read more about it on the website, www.bestcarebestfuture.com. And I personally read it this past week and found it fascinating. And it certainly is uh, an important guide for anyone who is interested in leadership, not only in health and health care, but I would say in any kind of organization that's going through change. Again, we invite you to submit questions, as Star explained before. And um, I'm going to get started. And Dr. Lawrence, welcome. I'm so pleased to have you sitting here in this dialogue with me today. Thank you, Mary. Glad to be here. So, you know, it's timely that we're having this conversation, and particularly around, you know, health reform and the ACA, because March 31st is the deadline for people to enroll. Do you have any thoughts about how the ACA will change healthcare and healthcare leadership in the future? Well, lots of thoughts. I'm not sure they're terribly well organized, but let me just take a take a crack at it. I, the ACA is is largely uh, directed to the financing of healthcare and, and and financial access for healthcare, but the the ripple effects through the healthcare delivery system are going to be significant. I think. In the ACA are a number of, of uh, elements that deal with reform in healthcare delivery, experiments and pilots and so on. Uh, but <clears throat> beyond that, I think there, what we can foresee is substantial contraction in the amount of money flowing into the care delivery system as efforts are uh, underway to try and constrain costs. Uh, what that means is lower margins. What it means is a lot of emphasis on organizing and integrating care delivery to try and get the benefit of, of more efficiency and better quality, and we'll talk about that, I hope, uh, during the course of the conversation. So I think this, this bill is going to have a dramatic impact over the longer term on the care delivery system and therefore has significant implications for healthcare care leaders who are engaged in care delivery, not necessarily on the financing side. That's already been well well discussed. But my, my interest, of course, is how care actually gets delivered to people. And I think that's where ACA will have a significant impact. That's great. And I have to push you a little bit because of my background in public health, and certainly the care delivery system is absolutely critical. But what about prevention and what you can do before people have to be taken care of in care delivery? Well, critical question. And, and it's going to be very interesting because the theory is that with the ACA and in particular the emphasis on accountable care organizations, bundled payments or capitation payments, the changes in the payment system that is slowly making its way through the care system, what begins to happen is you get the incentives moving you as a care delivery system to think further and further upstream in the disease process. Now, we haven't seen a big movement towards prevention and even further upstream towards wellness. We still try to deliver those services through the traditional medical care system, and they're not doing very well in trying to, uh, trying to make that happen. We're not using the institutions of public health delivery, for example, and community organizations yet. We're not using them very effectively. But where organ organizations like the one I was with and Kaiser and, Kaiser and Group Health and others like that where they've been around a long time, they've been able to move further upstream in the disease process and take advantage of many of these infrastructure capabilities that lie outside the traditional medical care system. And I, yeah, I'm hopeful, I wouldn't necessarily predict, but I'm hopeful that the squeeze, the change in reimbursement systems, and the continuing emerging science and technologies are all going to move us further upstream in that process. So we'll focus on prevention and screening more than we ever have before. What you're talking about isn't easy. You're talking about transformation. Um, and I, I think in your book, when you talk about collaboration as a central tenet of 21st century medical care, um, that's one of those issues that has to be really dealt with. And the Public Health Institute leads the National Leadership Academy for the Public's Health, which is a year-long fellowship to advance multi-sectoral collaborative leadership funded in part by the CDC as a way to try to bring together public health and health care in the design and implementation of really a system of health. 
there, as you said, are some incentives under the ACA to make that finally happen. And what we're seeing are many of the fellowship teams are embarking really on uncharted, uncharted territory in their own community or region. What would you suggest that they keep in mind as they work on this collaborative model and begin to take on that uncharted territory between community and public health and the delivery system? Well, that, I mean, that's a terrific question. And, and <clears throat> in my view, um, collaboration is an unnatural act in medicine. We're, we're, you know, if you start back way upstream in the medical care system as physicians, we're trained to master our craft, to master our profession, and it's an individual mastery. Uh, we're trained to really develop that professional uh, autonomy, if you will, that's a cornerstone of the physician profession. Um, so what you end up with as you look at today's healthcare system are a series of silos that are, that are defined almost by your professional training. As a physician, I got virtually no training in working collaboratively. In fact, most of my training served to isolate me, and the reimbursement system that I eventually worked under, the fee-for-service system, reinforces that siloed kind of behavior. So it's not natural to collaborate. And for that reason, it's extraordinarily difficult. You run into all sorts of barriers to collaboration that are the result of just the tradition of the way medicine and healthcare have been organized and, and the way we're socialized. So the question becomes, how do you break through that? Um, because the barriers are there, let's not kid ourselves. I think the way, the, the places that have been most successful at breaking through those barriers have been the ones that have engaged communities and patients and the families of patients in the process of collaboration so that you get the voice of the people you're serving helping you remind you why you're there. And I think that voice is extraordinarily powerful in helping us break through these kinds of long-standing barriers to collaboration that exist in medical care and health care. Could you share a couple of examples sure. of those uh, successful sites? Well, yeah. One I love is, is actually an anecdote that appears in, in John Toussaint's book uh, on the, the history of uh, the collaborative process that, it, that has taken place at, uh, at Theta Care in Wisconsin. And he describes, this is a medical care uh, example, but it's, it's instructive. A, a group of women had had a bad experience in obstetrics. They were upset about the care that they'd received. They didn't think that they were, their children were cared for properly. <clears throat> so they had a lot of complaints, and John brought them together with the Department of OB-GYN. And the women explained what had happened to them, and the doctors listened very disgruntledly, you know, very upset with being criticized. And finally, the chief of OB, according to John's story, the chief of OB says, why are we listening to these things? This isn't data. These are anecdotes. And the woman who was the leader of the group stood up and went over to him just enraged and said, I am not an anecdote. I am a person. I'm a real human being. This happened to me. Don't give me this, this data crap. And, you know, they basically had a confrontation that forced the guy to back away a bit and stop protecting himself by surrounding himself in this science, in the, in the, in the data-driven kind of model. <clears throat> That's where you break down some of these barriers. That allowed them to, to uh, attack the whole issue of how, uh, how uh, perinatal care was being provided. At the other level, more towards the question you'd asked about the public's health, I think a good example of this kind of dialogue is what happens in Chicago at Mount Sinai Medical Health System with their, their institute, which is their public health institute there. And the, the institute has really made it its business to work with the community and develop a better understanding of the health care issues that the community faces and then work backwards towards the medical care system to get the medical care system to be more responsive to those needs. That's a really, I think, a very powerful example of breaking down the barriers and using the voice of the community to do that. They actually go door to door there, don't they? Oh, yeah. They interview yeah. every household that's in that, in that area. In, the, in their catchment area. They've done it across a number of disease entities. They use community people to help with the interview process, to help interpret the data. Again, the voice of the patient, the voice of the community is a critical way to get collaboration to really work. Otherwise, you just get caught up in your little internecine battles uh, of medicine and healthcare that, that sort of stop that in its tracks. Let's shift gears a minute. You spent much of your career at Kaiser struggling to keep costs down while simultaneously improving patient access and quality of care. 
Given that the ACA was enacted in part because of rising health care costs as well as the access issue, do you have thoughts on the strategies that you mentioned in your book um, that can really address these thorny issues of access and cost? Yeah, I, I really do. And, and it, it, in fact, it's a central tenet in the, in the book itself. Um, the basic argument that I, I believe very deeply, and I think the evidence supports uh, pretty strongly, is that by focusing on delivering the best care possible, you actually are committing to a moral act, which is the moral uh, part of leadership that we all have to start with, but you're also committing to a process that has the very best opportunity to lower costs. By driving quality up uh, in the kind of way that is unending, continuous, constant effort to try and make things better, <clears throat> what you're doing is, is constantly focusing on the main driver of costs in healthcare, <clears throat> excuse me, which is unnecessary or unscientific variation in the way we practice. And so you're trying to narrow variation ever closer to being a single point solution. It's rare that we can get there. The science isn't really strong enough for that. But over time, what we find is that we can get narrower and narrower in what is allowed variation. The difference between the variation we have and what is what we get to by narrowing it is a delta that is, in fact, the source of significant savings. It's why virtually every major complex industry focuses on trying to drive that variation out of what they do. It's because there's, there, that's how you get dollars out of your cost structure. So I think what we, what we tr certainly tried to do at Kaiser and what is coming with the ACA and, and, and we see as a long-term strategy, as the best long-term strategy, is to focus on delivering the best care possible. That's an, an unending journey. It's an unending effort, and it's that effort that allows you to capture savings by reducing very un un in inappropriate variation, expensive variation. That's where the real dollars are in healthcare that we don't need to spend. Unnecessary care, inappropriate care, care that isn't planned properly, the, the recurrence of the redone redundancies in, in the healthcare process, all of those are what we're talking about when we reduce variation in clinical in, in, in the care process. Obviously, the further upstream you can go in screening and prevention and so on, the less you spend downstream, the less likely you are to get caught up in tertiary quaternary care, which is very expensive. The more you plan those processes so that it's seamless from the, the screening and prevention clear through to the proper treatment for those who need it, um, the better your care will be and the less expensive it will be. Uh, it's a very hard concept because we've always talked as though quality and cost reduction quality improvement cost reduction are antithetical. But actually the way you achieve cost reduction is by driving quality up. I think that's a really important point to make because I think the general public worries when we frame everything as reducing costs. And really what you're talking about is high reliability, something that a patient knows if they go there, the quality is always going to be high, excellent, and improving always. Yes. So I think that the, the framing of this is really important. Well, one of the things that certainly came through loudly and clearly to me in, in my time at Kaiser Permanente was uh, something I call the loud and soft words that we use. When you say we're going to raise quality and lower costs, all people hear is lower costs, which right. means, okay, you can't, you can't raise quality and lower costs, so what you're going to do is operate on the cheap. Cut corners. Yeah, cut corners. And so I, I tried, I wasn't always successful, but tried to remove the lowering cost out of the conversation because it's the natural consequence of doing quality right. Well, you describe in your book how you focused on improving quality in many, many different uh, chapters. And in fact, you became a national and an international guru and champion for quality and patient safety. And I put the two together because I think you really started in the quality area and that movement really understood that the two had to go hand in hand. Can you describe both your personal and your organizational journey and what were some of the key milestones in focusing on quality and safety? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. I, it began personally when uh, I, I actually, as part of the leadership development process that we went through inside of Kaiser Permanente, I, I was lucky enough to go to the uh, advanced management program at Harvard, the, the mini MBA program at Harvard. 
uh, as a as a an officer of the medical group in, in uh, Portland, Oregon. While I was there, I was, in, in all truth, I was bored to death with most of the courses. I just couldn't find the relevance to what I was doing or what I did in my job. But one of the things that really intrigued me was uh, were a couple of lectures on operational excellence. And I kept thinking, boy, there's something here for medicine, uh, for healthcare. And so on my own, I, I met with a professor and began doing a lot of reading of the, the, the literature at that time, Deming and so on. And they were just starting, Don Berwick was just starting to talk about it in, in New England Journal and a couple of uh, essays that he wrote, a couple of editorials. IHI was just getting off the ground a little after that, actually. So there was a beginning, a, a very nascent idea that somehow using the tools that had been very, very powerful and effective in other industries, using those in healthcare could really have an impact. And that registered with me, but it took several more years before I could figure out how we would introduce those kinds of ideas into an institutional setting that, that basically rejected that notion. Uh, we concentrate on what each doctor does, and we talk about variation in the way doctors treat and the, the, the way diagnosis is done by a doctor, and that's really not the issue. The issue is how care processes, care processes are defined from outside the, the medical care part of it upstream in healthcare all the way through to the medical care side. So the journey, once I, once I began to think about how to do it inside of Kaiser Permanente, it, it was mostly a lot of failures. I mean, the, in the early stages, we'd try this, we got, we, you know, we'd do quality improvement circles or quality circles, quality improvement. We'd do one tool after another that we tried. It took too long. It was too, you know, the, the results were too minor. It just didn't seem to make sense to me. So we started thinking about some institutional changes that could facilitate this journey, and I think there were two or three at Kaiser that were particularly seminal. Number one was the creation of the Care Management Institute, which began with the idea that the task was not so, that the hard task wasn't so much coming up with the way we were going to take care of a particular diagnosis, but in getting everybody to agree to do it and actually doing it, implementing it. So we put a lot of emphasis on actually getting the behavior to change at the ground level where patients were being cared for. That was a big deal, and it's still going on to this day. The second was the decision to link the organization with an electronic medical record, and that was a huge investment. It took really more than a decade to roll through the, the organization, but that facilitated a transparency that's a crucial part of quality improvement. And the third thing that really was quite, quite essential was the belief that we had to be in this together in order to make it happen. That, by we, I meant everybody who's engaged in touching patients or organizing healthcare. So, the way we, the way that came into being was uh, through the labor management partnership uh, at, at Kaiser Permanente between the union, many of the unions, not all, but 25 or 26 of the 35, 36 unions that we had at Kaiser joined the labor management partnership. And that enabled us to really engage people at all levels of the organization in the task of making things better. And so we, those were really crucial steps in my own journey towards uh, uh, trying to create a culture that enabled us to, to perform at a level that we hadn't before. Well, you worked your whole career really dramatically ahead of the curve, working on some of these issues that were not yet on everybody's radar and, and struggling to change the culture of an institution. And those changes were finally felt much later down the line, a situation that doesn't appear really that unique. It, it takes a long time to get things done. Are we destined or doomed to have major shifts take 20 years? And are there ways that you think leaders can change that time frame and become more nimble at making major changes? Well, I don't believe in miracles uh, or uh, silver bullets or, or you know, one-shot kinds of things. This is really hard because what we're doing here uh, is to change institutions that have really developed and become what they are now over a period of 100 years. The reimbursement systems, the professional systems, the legal systems, the socialization processes that go through that create the professionals and the people engaged in the, in the health care and medical care uh, enterprise are deep and very powerful. And so to change organizations uh, requires a kind of 
I would I would describe it as patient impatience. You 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 never can be satisfied. You got to keep going at it, keep going after it. But it takes years to change these organizations. And anybody who believes it can happen faster than that is smoking dope. Uh, if you happen to be in a state where that's legal, uh, um, there are other states where you can't do that. So maybe I'd use a different kind of analogy. But they're smoking something that doesn't make them realistic. It takes years. We. Uh, we had a meeting at, I, I remember very well, at the Lucian Leap Institute uh, on patient safety when we were talking to representatives from Denver, uh, Denver Health and also from Virginia Mason. And we asked the leaders uh, who had been at this transformation of their organizations for a decade, say, how's it going? How far along are you? And both of them <laughs> responded with the same thing. They both said, well, we're about halfway there. So, you know, they're looking at a 20 to 25 year period to try and transform an organization. And the important thing about that is, A, it takes a hell of a long time. But the second part of it is, B, it transcends or it cuts across leaders. One leader is unlikely to be there long enough to start it and finish it or get it completely done. It, you have to transfer that to a second leader or a third leader, and that's what's happened at uh, ThetaCare, for example. That's what Patty has done at, uh, at Denver Health. Um, Gary Kaplan, who's led this enterprise at Virginia Mason, is still in his position. He's about 14 years into his role as CEO. But he's now thinking about how to transition it to the next leader who can keep that thing going and, and add a, a very different perspective. This is long, hard work to get it to change. That's a really interesting perspective of trying to make that transition when you're ready to leave an organization and have someone else continue to carry the baton forward. Yeah. What do you see as some of the critical elements that you have to put in place while you're the, still the sitting leader to make sure that that happens? Well, it, it's it's one of the primary responsibilities of both a board and a CEO is to prepare for your for your departure, and I, I suggest in the book this actually wasn't my idea it came from Bill George who at the time was chairman and CEO of Medtronic, and we happened to be in a in a kind of a personal conversation and he asked me how long I was going to stay as CEO and I said I don't know you know I'm not sure I'm still having fun it's you know really exciting, and he said you know what I did when I took over as chairman and CEO, I gave the board my letter of resignation signed or dated 10 years in the future. He said, I had done enough research to find out how long a CEO can really be effective. And he said, after about 10 years, you've used up, you've used up your bank account with the organization, and then you're kind of treading water. It's awfully hard to continue to make big changes in an organization after that because you're tired and, you, and, and you've used up your, your currency in a way. So he said, I'd, I'd suggest doing that. I, I thought it was just stupid when, I, when he told me. Honestly, I went home and I, I told my wife I, that he had said this to me, and I thought, geez, what? I mean, you just leave yourself wide open when you say that. Then I got thinking about it, and I finally said to the board, I'm going to leave two or three years hence. And it was very liberating when that decision was made. So what I recommend in the book is actually the first thing that you do when you take over a CEO is to decide when you're going to leave. You may not communicate that with anybody, but what it does is give you a period of time that you, you are going to be actively trying to make change. And it allows you to kind of ignore some of the lesser stuff or to get wrapped up in a lot of the weeds because you're thinking about the fact all the time, I'm going to be going. I'm going to be leaving at such and such a time. That's the first thing. The second thing is the minute you start, you the, the, begin your job, you begin identifying the people who are going to succeed you and begin preparing them. And so the succession planning everybody talks about, but it's really hard to do and do well. You've got to have a cadre of people inside the organization who are capable of carrying on the work that you and they have done together. Um, it doesn't always work, but that's another responsibility you have. The other is to, in, is to make sure this isn't about you. This is about an organization that is deeply committed to this direction, and that's your job, really, as a leader, is to is to create the conditions, the commitments, the partnerships with the board, with the senior team, with the medical groups, with the, the, all the people in the in the, inside the organization, and most importantly, with the communities you serve and the and the people you serve. Creating those partnerships, that's where the momentum comes from, and that way, when you leave, you've got this whole forward momentum being created by these people demanding that that's what you continue to do. 
That's what you have to do in order to keep it going as after you leave. That's your job as a leader, basically. Really interesting. It provides a whole different level of urgency yeah. to the work that you take on. Absolutely. And a lot of and a lot of ways of ignoring things that are trivial, which can really wrap you up and keep you completely occupied if you're unwilling to confront these more difficult things or you want some excuse not to. Sage advice. You were famous in your career for the investments and the importance that you placed on technology. It's noteworthy that some similar healthcare systems really lagged in the arena of technology. What is the role of leadership in keeping a company abreast of current technology and innovation and what level of evidence do you think you need before making a major decision to invest in the next new thing? Hmm. Um, I think the leader has got to he have one foot in the outside world, and it's in the world where the technologies are beginning to emerge that actually are going to impact on healthcare. And the tendency that we mostly have, and I certainly found it was true. We're very, very busy in, in running a healthcare system. There's no absence of, of demands. So it's hard to make time to do this. But I think you're derelict in as a leader if you or someone in your organization doesn't have the responsibility for constantly scanning to see what's going on out there. The tendency is to look at healthcare applications and be narrow about this. But the most disruptive kinds of things are coming from outside of healthcare. And you've got, you've got to stay abreast, at least in a general way, with what kinds of things are emerging, and then try to guess how they could impact you, either positively or negatively, and worst of all, disrupt you and leave you, you know, just out of luck in terms of your ability to compete. So I think a leader has to do that. Now, the second part of the question is, what is the evidence? That's a really good question. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in randomized controlled trials for testing new ways to deliver care. I believe it's the gold standard when I'm putting something in you or doing something to your body. We want to know that. We have to know that, to know that it's safe and it's going to work. But when it comes to delivering care or del finding new ways of linking care together, the real question is what works. And the only way you do that is by looking at something, saying, hmm, i got to try it, and then I've got to learn my way to the solution, not study my way to the solution. There's really a very different kind of model. In healthcare, we always think of doing studies, pilots, doing the randomized controlled trial, testing this versus that. I think that's absolute garbage when it comes to how you organize care and care delivery. We have to try these things, we have to experiment, and we have to have the capacity. As part of this capacity you build in an organization for improving quality, Part of improving quality is learning what didn't work and making it better and better and better. Great anecdote occurred, same meeting that I mentioned earlier with uh, at the Lucian Leap Institute. We were talking about what had happened at several exemplary organizations, and, it, and we were sitting around the table afterwards saying, okay, what do we do? And several of the people, all of us from academia or from big institutions, said, we need to have pilots. We need to study what is going here, going there. We need to test this versus that to see if it really works. And this one guy that we'd invited happened to come from outside healthcare, and he raised his hand and he said, "Excuse me, if we did that in business, we'd be out of business. We can't do that. We do the best we can with the information we have. We make a decision, we try it, we experiment with it, and if it doesn't work, we kill it. Or if it does work or it looks like it still has promise, we make it better and better. And we learn our way very, very quickly through rapid learning to make it something that really has an impact." And it was just a showstopper when he said that, because it's just a different paradigm in the way we think about it in healthcare. Everything is about controlled trials. Right. Well, it, it certainly is antithetical to the way NIH and a lot of the government funding for healthcare research, healthcare innovation, um, you're almost in a catch-22. You have to have the innovation tested before you can get funded. Yep. But you know, you're you're arguing for a very different way for our R and D and health. I well, I and here, you know, however the NIH does it or uh, the, the government does it, that's one thing, and it's very important. You, one has to pay attention to that. But I don't think it makes sense in the context of how rapidly we can truly innovate in healthcare delivery. 
when it comes to cancer therapy or it comes to a new treatment for cardiac uh, arrest or whatever we're talking about, yes, we've got to be much more cautious. And, and I think the, the application of the gold standard there, the, the randomized controlled clinical trial, makes sense. But boy, when it comes to delivery, I just am not so convinced. Now, we have to, that doesn't mean to be cavalier about it or, or uh, irresponsible about it. You have to look very carefully to see how it can work and test it as much as the data allow, but not be caught in this catch-22 of analysis paralysis that allows other people to end run you or allows us to miss out on something that can really be an effective new way to get care to people. Well, CMS has the Innovation Fund, and right. hopefully some of those rapid tests are, are And they're using emerging. some of those tools. Yes, sure. exactly right. Sure. You discuss the lean model a lot in your book. Can you talk about how Kaiser's made some significant changes using lean as a model and its benefits, and how can that be applied to smaller organizations? Well, first of all, I can't tell you how it's worked at Kaiser because we didn't use lean when I was there. Okay. We used a number of different quality improvement tools, of which that was one. And every quality meeting, every patient safety meeting we held, there were storyboards about improvements in operations that were made using those techniques. So it just was ubiquitous. However, it wasn't the central way we operated. Okay. In my book, I argue that the, the most successful organizations in transforming themselves have made something like Lean or the Toyota production system or Six Sigma, something along those lines, the centerpiece of the way they get things done. That's how everything is done in their organizations, and they're smaller ones relative to Kaiser, for example. It is Virginia Mason, it is State of Care, it is uh, Denver Health, where they've used these techniques, this technique, as the centerpiece of the way they drive change in their organization. Um, it's very hard to inculcate a large, well-established, deeply rooted culture with that very different way of doing things. And that's, that's fundamentally what my book is directed to. What, what lessons can we learn from what I did at Kaiser, from people who have done around the country, to try and drive that kind of operating system deeply into the culture, the way you do things across the entire organization? It is non-trivial. It's very, very hard. How does it work? It's all around variation management. That's, that's the essential thing. And the other essential thing about it is to recognize that care delivery is a process. It is not a single act. So it starts in the patient's home, and it ends when the patient gets the best possible outcome from what it is we have to offer. And it can be anywhere along that continuum that the care is, is ended because of prevention or screening or maintenance or whatever we do. But it's a, an end-to-end -end process, and it's designing that process to have the most reliability and the least unnecessary variation it can possibly have, and then narrowing the variation with experience over time. And if you listen to Brent James at Intermountain Healthcare, you listen to Don at uh, Don Berwick at IHI, you listen to the people who led the effort at Virginia Mason, Theta Care, Denver Health. That's exact. That's all they do. That's what they focus on: constantly trying to narrow variation through study, through uh, not. I mean, through learning, rapid learning, and looking at the data through transparency and making it better and better and better. The other part of it that's so crucial is the people who have been able to move their organizations the furthest are those who have incorporated patients and their families and the communities in that dialogue about how to make the processes work better. It is not an expert-driven system. It is a collaborative system, and the answers come out of that, and the, and the measures come out of that conversation. Fascinating. I know a while back you held the belief that healthcare was not going to be able to change from within, that it was going to be outside forces that really drove the change. And it's a little ironic, you've written a guide for how healthcare can change itself. You want to comment on whether your, your thinking has changed or whether you're just being hopeful and putting this guide out? Well, I actually, I mean, I, I spent a long time trying, working with collaborators inside of Kaiser Permanente to make changes, and I know it's, it is really hard. And, and listening to the people I've mentioned talk about their journeys, it's really hard. Um, and it's dangerous. I mean, the, the, the systems don't like to make changes like this. They resist it. And there's a good reason that leaders of healthcare systems have relatively short tenures. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to do this stuff. 
But I felt I had to think about and write about all the things that I could learn, uh, that I had learned and could learn from others about how to change from within. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's not a losing process. It's just extremely slow, as we've said all along. What I worry about uh, for the existing healthcare systems, and I'm encouraged by, because it's where I've been spending a lot of time, too, is that these disruptive innovations are occurring around the healthcare system and are going to set it on, set it on its ear. Uh, these changes are really big time changes. They're demonstrating how we can deliver much of primary care away from the traditional medical care system. We can do much of prevention and screening and wellness using technologies and tools that are not under the aegis of the public health departments, not under the aegis of the institutions. And in fact, those institutions are almost indifferent or it, they're blind to these changes in my mind. So at the end of the day, I think what we have is an effort to try and change everything we can inside the existing systems where change is possible. But at the same time, we're, it's a race against time uh, for many of these things because these technologies that are beginning to emerge now after 10 and 20 years of financing for private equity and venture capital groups, these technologies are beginning to get some real purchase and they're exciting. I mean, they really provide a whole new way of thinking about the way we deliver pieces of the medical care and healthcare puzzle, away from heavy dependence on people, heavy dependence on the old professions that we all know and love, the old institutions that we've all tried so hard to change. So I see a real tension between these two things. I don't, you know, I'm not against making changes in the systems we have. I love these systems. I've been part of them. I've worked in them. So I, I wrote the book, really, for that group of people, but meanwhile, around them are things going on that are pretty telling, they're pretty exciting. Sounds like in the landscaping that you're suggesting, there better be somebody watching those and listening and bringing those voices, because you're going to have a very different patient population to deal with. Well, those yeah. Those technologies. Absolutely. I mean, if you stop and think about, just look at the numbers, uh, the sheer numbers, the whole primary care system is just crashing in healthcare in the United States because of the, the, the lack of primary care physicians being trained, the numbers are, I mean, it depends on who you read and I know people have different views about how much uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners are gonna substitute for, for physicians and so on, but the numbers don't really add up. And moreover, the technologies are enabling us to deliver many aspects of primary care, including prevention and screening, at much lower cost, much more accessibly to people in the communities and that don't rely on these big institutions. So yeah, I think you have to keep track of these things outside of traditional systems, if you, just so you're not taken by surprise. The first reaction I get when I talk about many of these things is, oh, baloney. And I think, oh man, that's the wrong way to think about this. Is it should be, oh my goodness, this is this could really be disruptive. Be looking for those things that don't look like they have much purchase, but just watch out for them because these are the ones that catch you by surprise. Right. Well, even the the new entrants where certain industries have all of a sudden started to add a healthcare component to yep. them are, are things that we need to be absolutely much more aware of. Sure. I have a question from um, the audience that I wanted to share, and it. it this person's asking, what opportunities should we promote in our dual roles as health professionals and patients consumers of health care? Interesting question. Hmm. Well, I, I, I want to go back to this idea of how what the most effective lever is on the care system. It, it, is, it is truly the voice of the patients and the voice of the, of the families and the voice of the communities. Um, so in your role as a health professional, <coughs> It's easy to hide behind our profession and, and say we know better. But if you as a joint health professional and, and a patient can remember that it's the voice as a patient that is the most powerful voice in coming into an organization, that's where you can have the most impact. I'm, I was really delighted when I met the people at, the, uh, at one of the medical systems in New York um, and it, it's Long Island Jewish in the hospitals of, of that system. And I remember talking to Michael Dowling, who's the, the CEO of that group, and he, he used a term that I just love, which is that it's his goal to have the organization and the people in it marinate in the voices of the patient. Great. Isn't that a great, that's that's a great, a great term. Tune, uh, term? And, you know, what he's done, I think, is probably 
I don't, I, you know, I didn't try to do comparative studies, but it certainly was one of the more interesting ones I heard about in terms of the many ways in which patients are plugged into the decision-making systems of that organization, from patient care decisions for individuals to design of patient care systems by groups of individuals working with professionals to design a strategy to large questions about where we put things, all of the patient's voices everywhere. And it's the patient's telling us in their voices. It's not somebody else being an intermediary. It's not surveys. It's not studies. It's listening to these guys tell their stories and being face-to-face -face with them, and that's really powerful. Those stories really have an impact on an institution, especially if they occur all the time, everywhere. Board of directors meeting, every board of meeting, every board of directors meeting starts with a patient telling his story. Every senior team meeting starts with that. Every medical staff meeting starts with that. I mean, it's everywhere. And I thought, that's, that's genius. I mean, most of us occasionally include patients in the design of things. You know, Cincinnati Children's uh, you know, reportedly has, I don't know, 50 or 60 work groups going at any given time. They all have patients or families, uh, members on them. That's really pretty substantial. We didn't do that much of that way at Kaiser when I was there. We, we thought about building bridges to the community, but we were still more insular. We, we thought we could do it with ourselves. When we did venture out and had interactions with patients, it was it was it changed the way we did things pretty dramatically. So I can't even remember where I was on this. But this is, yeah, no, this, was, this is really the, well, the, you're, corner, you're, the cornerstone issue. Yeah, you're response. hitting on you're hitting on some uh, points that the audience is interested in because we've had several people sending questions um, about you know asking by unscientific variation. Do you mean reducing weight? similar to lean and the lean concepts, and, and also saying you've hit a, a great point on misplaced space and, and randomized uh, clinical trials for things that aren't, you know, specific care focused and yeah. are more organizationally focused. So you're definitely hitting on, on some of those uh, points that people are interested in. Let me take us back to leadership for a minute. In your book, you talk about really starting slowly, as, and that's a big theme for, for gathering your, your leadership currency, if you will. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important and how you do it, and give some advice to those people who may be starting out in an organization or may be at an inflection point in their career? Is it possible to reset and start slowly again, or do you only have one chance when you're new in an organization? That's a really good question. And I, you know, I know that I, I reset a couple of times during my leadership experience, and it's possible to do it, but you're carrying more and more baggage uh, the longer you wait to do a reset. That, and that's why I put so much emphasis on doing it at the beginning of a new assignment. Uh, and particularly taking on the leadership of a healthcare system of any size, any sort. And what I was really saying is there is a vast pressure, especially in our culture, to act, to get things done, to do something, to make decisions, to deal with this issue, deal with that issue. And God, the cacophony is just enormous when you start this process. You also have hanging over you, or may have hanging over you, what your predecessor did. And you may want to show yourself as somebody who's different from how your predecessor did things. So you want to want to set a different kind of tone. So you undo some of the things that they've done. Well, what I what I came to appreciate actually is that every one of those actions you take is a description of you as a leader. It 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 helps an organization form an image of you, form a story about you. And very quickly, you no longer control the narrative. The organization has a narrative about you, and it's very difficult to, to break out of that narrative. And so what I suggested was, don't act. If you can only act on the few things that you absolutely have to, you have no choice. If you're taking over a dying organization or an organization that needs to be turned around right away, of course, you've got to do things. But to the extent your circumstances permit, breathe. Take time. Listen, it's the, it's the only time you have in your career where people will tell you what's on their mind about what they'd like to see in the organization because there's no story about you yet. Right. You are new. It's all the hope, all the prayers, all the kinds of things that they lay on top of you 
that's the time to gather information. It's also the time to build your partnership networks, your, your really your power networks that you need to have, which are based on your ability to communicate across the organization in many, many places. I remember when I took over as chief of staff of, of Best Kaiser Hospital in Portland uh, and was the area medical director for the northern part of Portland and Vancouver, somebody suggested this to me. I, I didn't, I wouldn't at the point where I knew enough to do it, but they said, go and talk to the docs and find out what's on their mind because you're their representative, you're their leader. So I spent the first two months, I think it was, just going and meeting with all the docs. There were 150 docs. And I spent maybe an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, with as many of them as I could possibly meet with. And I think I met with the, the vast majority of physicians. I don't remember. But man, oh man, was it, it was so important because I, it forced me not to form preconceptions about what the issues were. It forced me not to create a dialogue or a, a story about me. It allowed me the, the, the luxury of learning who they were and what their issues were. And it also gave me great in, insight into who could help and who couldn't help, who were allies and who weren't, who were the people I could call on to help inform me about issues that we had to deal with in that particular area. So the go slow kind of comp, uh, suggestion, the building your communications network, the building your information base so you really understand in greater detail the kinds of things going on in the organization, all of those are crucial. The minute you change jobs in an organization, you, you are going to see things in a different way. And you need, to get, you need to have time to formulate what you're seeing and understand what you're seeing. And you can't, you can't rely on the biases you bring from your prior job. You've got, to kind of, you've got to have a break. You've got to have a different way of seeing. Well, I can relate to that because before taking on the role as president and CEO of PHI, I'd been on the board. You'd been on the board, and yeah. And I thought I knew the organization, but I did take that time to stop and listen because many of my preconceived notions as a board member were quite different Absolutely. from sitting inside the organization. Abs absolutely. One of the things that you mention in your book is that we're all in this together and that all levels have to play equally. What are the challenges to really making that happen and what are the outcomes that make it worth it? Well, the basic idea is that you cannot design responsive and effective care processes start to finish without everybody who, who touches those care processes being involved in helping design them. There's no expert who's smart enough to do that. There's no small group that's smart enough to do that for very long. So from patient to person on the floor to person, you know, right there with the hands on, all the people who rely on those systems, they all have to have, they all have a role in helping design those, those care processes end to end. The, at, at Virginia Mason, it's called value chains, and they define a value chain as a care process from start to finish. And when you, you map all the people who have to perform in order to make that value chain the highest level performance as possible, the highest quality as possible, you begin to realize you can't do it without all of these people from top to bottom. It's not just a matter of making sure the doc does the right thing. I mean, crime and eat, I, in a chronic disease patient, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's something like seven to nine physicians are engaged in most patients with chronic illnesses care. Uh, and then you put behind that the nurses and the nurse aides and the people who have to, all the people who have touched, it's hundreds of people. So. You, if you just stop and think about trying to design the care processes to be as high quality and high reliability and robust as possible, you can't do it without everybody. We say everybody. What, what that really is saying is you've got to have people from all levels who are engaged in that design process and that learning process. Now, there are huge obstacles to doing that. You know, healthcare is built, uh, or medical care particularly, is, is built around a very strong hierarchy with the doctors at the top. You, you know, historically at the top. It's built around a culture of blame. It's built around a culture of trying to avoid looking stupid. It's, I mean, there are all these mixes in here that make it very difficult to think as a, as a flat, a gathering of people who are basically equal in helping design these processes and run these processes. It's not easy. It's not trivial. 
and it's a battle. I think that's why it takes so long to transform an organization. It's not skills so much as it is attitude and culture that allows you to deal with people this way. So it takes a long time to inculcate that. I, there's one anecdote that I, I occurred to me after, after I left Kaiser. I was, I was at a fellowship uh, for a few months, and I went up to visit a cardiovascular surgeon in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, who had really done a great job instituting something called team rounds. So every morning, he is the cardiovascular surgeon, and the team of people caring for the patient went into the patient's room with the patient's family, and they spent 20 to 30 minutes deciding what was going to happen with that patient. The really cool, there were two or three cool things that happened. This took a long time to put together, but the first question they asked is, what did we tell you we were gonna do yesterday that we didn't do? Where did we screw up, basically? So the patient, first thing out of the patient's mouth and the family's mouth was, well, you know, he had a headache, you never got any back to him, or you know, this or that. It was marvelous. Set a very equal tone. Then each person around the team talked about what they had observed and the questions they had from their particular perspective of the patient. Then they talked about what they were gonna do. Then the person who had responsibility for taking all this information down gave back to the patient sort of the list of things that were going to happen in the next 24 hours and asked, did we forget anything? Questions that we didn't answer, problems that we haven't res responded to. It, it, unless I, unless I, if I hadn't known who was the doctor in that discussion, I wouldn't have been able to tell. There was one marvelous conversation between a pharmacist and the, and the physician, and the physician wanted to prescribe a particular drug, and the pharmacist said, no, that's not the right one for this patient, and they got into a, a, a tussle over the information. And the pharmacist, finally the doc said, I, you know, I gotta go with you. you, you know this better than I do. And I thought, my gosh, this is really flat. This is how collaborative care really should go. That's the good news. Bad news is that when it came time for this guy to be, to be re-upped on his faculty appointment at Dartmouth, uh, the physicians at the Concord Hospital banded together and blackballed him and he was not rehired. And part of it was, or a large part of it had to do with, they were very threatened by the fact that he had created a non-hierarchical kind of team to take care of his patients and was having great outcomes by all reports. Um, but they were not happy with that, out, with that process. They wanted the hierarchy. They liked the idea of everybody bowing and scraping to themselves. So it's hard to give it up. It's hard to give it up. So, well, I would imagine in a setting like that, you would have to have a different language that you used as well. Absolutely. Because if that team stood around the patient and the family and spoke in the kind of jargon and the mm -hmm. medical terms that we often use, it's very distancing and the patient and the family wouldn't feel like they could really engage. Exactly right. And part of the thing that makes it possible to learn how to speak differently is to have the patient empowered, taught, helped to say, huh, you know, I don't get it. What did you just say to me? And that's wonderful when that happens because it really catches people up on the jargon they use. The other thing that goes on with this is really interesting. A lot of people said, gosh, you're taking a half an hour to do rounds on a single patient or 20 minutes on a single patient. And the staff would say, do you realize how much time that saves us? Because we all know what we're going to do now. We're all, we've all got our marching orders, and we all know what we have to do the rest of the, the, rest of the uh, day. It's not one person coming in talking to the patient, then the next person coming in from their profession talking to the patient. It's very, it's coordinated. It's integrated care. It's the best possible way to take care of these patients. It's what we all want to have. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we don't want to have to be there guarding our loved one. Oh, I know. Yeah. You, you talked a little bit before about you know having an exit strategy. In your book, you you talk really honestly and refreshingly about some of your shortcomings when you first began your role at, at Kaiser. And can you tell us a little bit about how you came to see those? Is it only in hindsight after being gone from the organization a long time that you see those? Or um, were there some ways that you were able to get good advice and some things that the people who are listening to us might be able to put in place so that they can short circuit some of the mistakes that everybody makes. Absolutely. Well, no, it was not not in hindsight. I mean, I made mid-course corrections, and the important things that allowed me to make mid-course corrections was I had, there were people on the leadership team with me who were truth tellers, who who whom I trusted and who 
felt um, confident enough to tell me that I was full of it. And absolutely crucial. I mean, I could dismiss it when it was somebody who had a gripe with me. Um, you know, I could I could kind of brush that off and say, well, they're just upset because of this or because of that. But when the people around me could come up to me and hold up a mirror, um, that really meant a great deal to me. And, and I describe in the book how several people came to me and said, you're just not listening enough. You're not, you're not hearing what people are saying to you. You're not hearing what's happening in the organization. Uh, you're too isolated. Um, and it, it, it just happens to be my own failing as a human being is when I get under pressure, I try to do more and more myself and I get more and more stubborn about what I want to get done. And I put my head down and just, you know, drive forward through whatever is standing in front of me. And having people around me who could say, hey, you know, we're here, and here's some of the things that you could do that could make it better for all of us and better for you as a leader, that, that kind of feedback really stopped me in my tracks. Uh, that was perhaps the most important thing. A supportive circle. A, a, supportive, a supportive but critical circle. And you know, I Not yes people, but no, people who would gently tell you. And not so gently. And not so gently. Okay. <laughs> no, there were, there, you know, you, you don't need to stand on, you know, walk on eggshells. You need to be pretty. You, know, you don't have time to be all that gentle. You need to, you need to be pretty straightforward. The truth tellers. Truth tellers, and that was one thing. The second thing is just looking at what was working and what wasn't. You know, there were a lot of things that we put in place that didn't work, and you had to be honest about that and not say it's just because they didn't want it. Sometimes it's you, the way you designed it, the way you implemented it, that was the wrong way to do it. And I had plenty of those things. Um, and I think the other thing was just constantly doing my own personal inventory about how I could be more effective. You know, you can't ever stop learning about that. And so the input that came from people who cared or who were with me and from people who didn't and from things that weren't working and a constant effort to want to be better at what I did, I think all came together. And you sort of make mid-course corrections as you right. go along. And you have to. You can't. You know, circumstances change. And, you know, what I was able to do when I was finishing my 11 years at Kaiser were completely different things than I could do when I started. I was a very different person. I learned for 11 years. It was an amazing learning experience. And I think that's at the core of what the question is. You change because you learn. If you don't learn, you have no business being in the job. Well, isn't the board of directors supposed to engage in that role, too? But you know, an you ideal board? Be you already gave that answer, Mary. You said, you know, when you were a board on the PHI, you right. were a board member, and then you didn't sure. really know enough until you came into the organization to know what was really going on. The board was very helpful. I don't mean to say that they weren't. They were extremely helpful and extremely supportive and extremely helpful in, in, in being honest with me about what they saw. Right. But that was only one perspective of what was going on. The people I dealt with every day inside the organization knew much more about the nuts and bolts of what was going on. I needed their input, too. It's a both and. Yeah, yeah. And it's also the role of the CEO to make sure that they are giving a board the right information so that they can reflect yeah. from their governance perspective, Absolutely. I think, which is sometimes hard to do. You don't always want to lift up your, your failings or your yeah. inconsistencies, whatever. Yeah. We've had a couple of um, listeners ask some questions. One asked uh, if you would please respond again of, of what organizations are doing team rounds. There's someone who's interested in doing that. And where might they get more information about it? Well, I think this one was, happened to be at the Concord Hospital in New Hampshire, and it was, it was pioneered. Mary and I were talking about this uh, earlier today, but it was pioneered at, at Harvard. Uh, I, I think if you look up the term team rounds, you'll see where uh, people are trying to do it. They're, they're doing it in a number of different ways around the country. Um, you know, typically what happens with many of these kinds of innovations is you'll get somebody who pushes the idea, a doc or a group of nurses who want to try and do that. So you'll see it in pockets here and there. I don't know anyone, and I, it's, it's not because they aren't doing it. I'm just not, uh, I just don't know enough about what's happening operationally to know where an entire institution is doing team-based rounds, perhaps right. as a matter Maybe of... Maybe on IHI's website. There'll yeah, be you can a, probably a find it there. Yeah. Right. It's certainly powerful. I think that there's no question that it's really powerful. And if you believe in collaborative team-based care, 
then clearly team rounds are part of the t one of the tools you use to make that happen. Right. We had another question asking about collaboration with primary care and with people who are in behavioral health and kind of the, the shared risk and the patient focused care. How do you how do you really open the door for those uh, behavioral health providers to be interacting more closely. Is that something that you've dealt with or you've seen some good examples you might share with our audience? Well, uh, yeah, this is a big issue. I mean, we know that depression and other behavioral issues are very, very prevalent uh, across the population uh, and that we're not doing a terrific job of dealing with the behavioral issues in primary care necessarily. Um, some, some. I don't mean to be critical of all clinicians, but, but it, in general, we're not doing a great job with that. Um, we also tend, in our infinite wisdom, to, to isolate or specialize. So the primary care doc has a bunch of responsibilities. The behaviorists have a bunch of responsibilities. The psychiatrists have subset responsibilities. So we tend to siloize these things. The fact is, people come in through multiple entry points, and all of those entry points whether it's the emergency room, the urgent care clinics, the ready clinics, the primary care physicians, the nurse practitioners, et cetera, all people who are engaged in meeting people for the first time have to be aware of and skilled in being able to distinguish whether or not somebody is having a behavioral overlay, some kind of behavioral problem overlay on the other kinds of problems they've got. Same is true all through the care process. I mean, diabetics who are having trouble with in, uh, instability, uh, in managing their diabetes or people who have chronic illness of any sort are dealing with a host of behavioral uh, issues as well. We tend to, to separate those out and isolate them and treat them as separate from the core of what's going on in a human being. I think we do that at, at our peril. There's some really interesting ideas. Um, Rand, for example, did a study probably 10 years ago that looked at people who were depressed and compared having a physician take care of them and a physician and a nurse take care of them, psychiatrist in both cases and a nurse in the second, with the nurse being the primary caregiver and the, the physician being a backup to change medications. Interestingly enough, the end point, believe it or not, was what happened to the um, to um, net worth year on year. That was the end point. And the thesis was that if people are depressed, or man and these were people who were diagnosed with depression, People who are depressed don't do a great job of managing their affairs, and it manifests itself in either a destruction of net worth or no improvement in net worth because they're not able to deal with a lot of the problems that they have to deal with. So in this particular study, the nurse plus psychiatrist model had a much more dramatic impact on net worth positively than just a psychiatrist alone, arguing for team-based care, a form of team-based care. Another model is is a, a company that I know and I'm working with, and I so I don't want to I want to be very clear about full right. disclosure, but it's a small company that's just starting out, but it's developed a behavioral screening system uh, for a, a host of behavioral diseases, and it's done on an iPad for the consumer, and it can be done in the doc's office, in the nurse's office, or at home. And it's a very simple, it, it's translating the scales that are often used for screening and behavioral uh, care. It's translating those into very simple to use iPad application. And it's, it's ingenious. And so they're using it now at the family practice program at UCLA, as I understand they're using it in, in, a, in a screening program in New Mexico, several places around the country. It's a fascinating approach. It's one of those ideas that I mentioned earlier about technology, which is kind of doing an end run on the traditional problems we have with the traditional medical care delivery system and model. Right, very interesting. Well, I've, we've got a couple more questions that, that we'll talk about, and I know you've done a lot of global work. And before I kind of wrap us up, any insights from what you've seen in other countries that have been real innovations that we should be considering here in the U.S.? And, you know, how do we get more learning from uh, those innovative sites that are outside of our lens right here? Well, I think I think it's very useful to look at some of the most innovative places in Europe. For example, Sweden is is a classic, and Inter the Institute for Healthcare Improvement is often cited. Uh, places in in uh, in Sweden, some interesting experiments at the NHS, and so on. These tend to be variations on the same theme, however, of just more docs or different use of personnel, and still the traditional medical care public health system working more efficiently and more effectively. 
Some of the more interesting ones to me are where countries have a dearth of healthcare professionals or are running out of money or are running into the real constraints and are trying to leapfrog what many of us call the 20th century public health and medical care solution model and leapfrog into the 21st century using technology more effectively. Now, there's a battle in every one of these countries that I've seen, at least, is a battle between trying to me too what they see in the West and build Western hospitals and Western care delivery systems and Western specialties. But at the same time, there's this enormous pressure because it just isn't enough. There aren't enough resources to do that. So they're looking at other kinds of solutions. And so, I mean, if you go to Israel, there's some fascinating ones. If you go to China, if you go to Singapore, if you go to Vietnam, if you go to Indonesia, uh, if you go to India, if you go into Africa, all those places, there's some fascinating kinds of innovations going on that are, I think, some really interesting lessons for us. Many are still very new. They're very young. They haven't gathered scale yet, but they're promising, and we've got to keep our eyes on them because in many ways, ours, our system and many of the systems in Europe are the most most difficult to change. They're the most resistant to change. And these other places have, for a variety of reasons, less constraints on what they can do and experiment with. In fact, I think it's so much the case that we're so constrained here in the U.S. and in, in Europe that many of us who deal in, in, in private equity venture capital in, uh, investments, for example, encourage the companies to go outside the United States to try and, gr and to grow their technologies because they can do so out from under the FDA underneath the, out from under the, the, the state medical societies and all the kinds of regulations that they have to leap through and the reimbursement systems and all that sort of stuff. So I'm keeping my eye on what's going outside of the, out, on outside the United States. I'm involved with some of them. I can't give you specific ones yet because they're too nascent. Okay. All and right. The dynamics are very different. But we should be keeping our eyes out there. Well. This is PHI's 50th anniversary, and while we're celebrating so many of the things that have really contributed to public health and health improvement over the last 50 years, uh, to name a few, reduction in smoking, improved immunizations, family planning technology improvements, um, the ability to really eradicate a lot of the infectious disease through, you know, clean water and immunizations and really to take a look at understanding that nutrition and physical activity are an important part of the equation and I could go on and on. But one of the things we're really focused on at PHI as we're celebrating those successes of the past is what should public health be targeting in the future. And we've been asking people to go on Facebook and we have a slide up now with our Facebook and our, our Twitter address to share their thoughts with us about what public health should be like, what it should be attacking, what it should be supporting in the next 50 years. Let's hear your perspective about public health. You're an old public health doc as well as being the CEO of a major healthcare system and insurance group. Well, this is, this is a wonderful question. I can't wait to see what people submit in, in response to the question because, you know, the the short answer is anything goes, who knows. But I'll give you an opinion. I, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but as I look at, at, particularly at the United States, but it's true in many other parts of the world, so much attention is given to the medical care system uh, that there continues to be this giant sucking sound of money and, and, and manpower being sucked into secondary, tertiary, and quaternary care to the real detriment of everything in front of that. And so what's happening is we're starting to, we know that there is plenty of science to support what is possible upstream from the medical care system. We know that. The real issue is how do we deliver that? I don't see the public health departments, frankly, making the kinds of radical changes any more than you see the medical care delivery systems making radical changes. It's awfully hard when you've got so much institutional inertia. But the technologies that are beginning to emerge are addressing, uh, they're addressing, or coming up with solutions all along the value chain prior to the time a patient has to get medical care. And let me give you a couple of examples. And these are things I know because I'm associated with these companies. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not 
touting these companies, but they just are the kinds of things that make me quiver with excitement when I start thinking about them. Say, for example, that you could easily screen a population for definitive diagnoses of up to 30 different conditions using a lab slide and protein signatures. It's not possible. Uh, one of the companies I know is, is, has been working for a decade to come up with the technology that allows you to capture proteins in circulating, in circulating blood, capture proteins, dye them, measure them, and establish protein signatures. They have a library of over 2,500 different binding sites, possibly, and they have identified up to, it's getting close to, 30 distinct clinical conditions. They can do this for about $100, getting down towards $100. It takes about 40 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Well, when you have that kind of capability, you, you are not tied to a hospital or a doctor's office. You can do this anywhere. So it can go into a Walmart or a Walgreens. It can go into a ready clinic. It can go into a nursing home or a, a senior facility. It's, it's, not, it's screening that allows you, before a patient even knows they have disease, to identify these illnesses and start intervening in a way that we've never been able to before, except through these very crude kinds of screening, like blood pressure screening or something else like that. So that's an example of something that's using the primary measure of whether or not disease is present, which is circulating proteins that are breakdown right. products or something else, Metabolomes would be another. Much more powerful diagnostics than genetics are um, so far. Um, but that's a, very, that's a very interesting opportunity to do screening very differently and to set up a referral channel for those people who have the, the diagnoses established. This isn't probabilities. These are real diagnoses. To jump them right over the queue and go to tertiary and quaternary care when they need it. It's a very different way to take a look at surveillance, that's yeah. for sure, from Absolutely. public health parlance. Absolutely. Or a, an infectious disease test that has been developed in Seattle for a range of public health or infectious diseases that can be done modularly, disease by disease, in about, uh, I, think, I think I was told the other day that it's about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, at a very low cost. So instead of having to send it off and have it tested and all, you know, developed on the, on the, on the your bacterial plate and all that stuff, they can do these tests very quickly for a range of things. Now, we were just in the Middle East, I was just there last week, and we were talking about what happens in, a, in something like Saudi Arabia where there are, I, I can't remember the total numbers, who come for Hajj every year, but it's in the million uh, people who arrive in Mecca. And they come from all over the world, Muslims from all over the world, and they're bringing all sorts of illnesses with them. And they have to screen that population to keep Saudi safe and, and keep each other safe, the people who are there. This is a tool that can be used at the border. It can be used with, these, uh, with this population, this very transient population. Those are the kinds of things that I, I see as, as carrying great promise for everything upstream from the traditional medical care system. It disrupts what we've always said about the primary care doc and the medical home. I think the medical home, honestly, is a sandcastle. There are not enough docs. There are not enough docs who are trained. There are not enough to be able to take care of an entire population. It's a wonderful idea. And where it exists and works, it could be stupendous. It does very well at Kaiser, for example. But we, we hear wonderful success stories. But the reality is we've got a big shortage of primary care docs. We've got to find other ways of dealing with these issues all the way upstream in what we've called traditionally primary care and public health. So I think the biggest future is really around disruptions that are going to take off pieces of those and do them in ways that we've never contemplated before. There are some of us who believe that we really need to be looking at community care organizations, and yes. you know this is an old, yep. old yep. saw for me. Um, and we've seen some incredible shifts in terms of the health of a population 
by having strong community support, Absolutely. by dealing with the issues of inequities in terms of, you know, poverty and access to healthy foods. And yeah, right. do you see that as continuing to be issues we're going to be grappling with out in the future? And oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm neither conservative nor liberal in this sense, but I think the reality is that poverty is always going to be here in some form or another. There are always going to be disadvantaged populations of some sort or another. It doesn't mean we should therefore not stop trying to figure out how to s solve their problems or work with them to solve their problems. But the core idea that you have is of community organizations who play a role in shaping the way health care and medical care is delivered. That to me is a major thrust over time. They may be organized community entities. They may be something that care systems organize to help them in these processes. If you go to Asheville, North Carolina, and talk to Ron Paulus, what he's done is to bring community members in to help him decide where he needs to put the, many of the places, many of the uh, installations for his health care system that he runs. So it can be formal, it can be informal, institutional, non-institutional, but it's a crucial, crucial area, I think, to shape the care system in the future. Interestingly enough, the more people you engage in this process, the more in the community you engage, the less you, you spend time worrying about tertiary and quaternary care. That's got to be there. That's got to be good when it's needed. But people want solutions to their living problems, you know, their day-to-day -day problems. And they want help in dealing with them so they can live a, a high-quality life. And most often, the medical care system isn't dealing with those issues. It's dealing with the, the tragedies and the, and the failures. Well, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to not only identify those risk factors <clears throat> based on the proteins in our blood, but we'll also be able to identify those community risk factors sure. in the future and yeah. do a better job on both sides of, you, you of that bet. equation. You bet. You know, Dave, this has been a fabulous dialogue. Thank you so much for spending time with us today and traveling here to PHI. The lessons in your book are really universal, and you've done a great job today in illustrating, I think, their application to health and health care. But I urge everyone to take a look at this book and um, really try to apply some of these really great lessons for leadership to whatever situation and setting they're in. I want to thank our audience also for joining us today in this new format. The slides and the audio will be available on our website, and we encourage you to send your comments. If you like this format and want to see more, we'll uh, be happy to look at those comments you will have an opportunity to take an evaluation survey. We ask you to be candid because we shape these programs based on your feedback. Again, thank you for joining us. Wish everyone a good day, and Dave, thanks so much. Thank you very much for inviting me.